I know there are darkly humorous moments to all of this. Yeah. Right. And that's part of what has made this entire franchise so compelling. But it is serious. You are part of pop culture. You are, like we've mentioned, people go, but oh, we're going to show up here and Chris Hansen's going to be here. Yep. Like, I mean, that Sometimes is, I am. That is pop <laughs> culture. <laughs> Hey, everybody, we'd like to welcome everybody to another episode of the X5 Podcast. Um, man, I'm going to tell you what, I'm super excited today for the guest that we have in studio. Um, you probably know him from To Catch a Predator on NBC uh, Dateline, uh, Predator Hanson vs. Predator, as well as his new episode on True Blue, Take a Seat with Chris Hanson. In studio with us right now, we got the famous, infamous Mr. Chris Hansen. Yes. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. Thanks, guys, for having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So, man, like we've been talking for a little while, and I've been, you know, we've been talking about getting you down sure. here. Um, so, uh, right now, you're doing a new series of Predator investigations. Exactly. So, we have our new streaming, actually, it's almost a year old as we sit here today, True Blue, T R U B L U, watch TrueBlue.com, is my streaming network. Uh, where we do new documentaries and the new Predator series, which we call Takedown with Chris Hansen. And in the last year or so, we've actually put up 50-some new segments, wow. Wow. new investigations. And we've been around the country, uh, from Florida to Michigan to Ohio, and we're getting ready to do some other locations, doing these sting operations. And 20 years after the initial Predator investigation, It'll be 20 years in February of this year, of next year. Guys are still showing up at the Sting House. <laughs> and, and honestly, you know, we, we talk about how did the idea start and all that, but I, I never envisioned this turning into what it's turned into. I figured we'd do it two or three times and guys would stop showing up. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that's not what's happened. It, it, I, I was thinking about that driving over. I thought, man, if, if, well, I guess they don't think normal anyway. But if I was <laughs> right. a predator, I would see the phenomenon that is to catch a predator and go, boy, we better tighten up, guys. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not going to anybody's house. I should stop doing this because now we're going to get on national television. Well, it's, you know, gotten to the point where guys will raise the question in the chat yeah. with oh. the decoy posing as the child. So routinely... In virtually every investigation we do, somebody says, I don't want to walk into a Chris Hansen deal. I don't want Chris Hansen to tell me to have a seat. I don't want to run into Sheriff Grady Judd or Sheriff Chris Swanson, you know, sheriffs we work with over and over again. And yet they show up anyway. Yeah. Every time. And the guy comes in and sees me and sometimes you'll say, oh, Chris Hansen, before I can say a word. <laughs> and it's almost like they think, okay, this is the part of the show where I've got to sit down and talk to Chris. Yeah. Now, you know, one out of every 10 tells me to pound sand and they don't talk. But the vast majority of these guys want to get it off their chest or at least try to convince me that they weren't there to violate a child. They were there to help the child, warn the child, whatever excuse they come up with. You just had one that mm -hmm. came out that I watched a, a clip for on, on YouTube where you asked the guy what he was doing there and he actually said, I came here to see if you were going to be here. Yes, exactly. What I mean, what, <laughs> his, exa his exact yeah. thing was, I, I, I came to see if Chris Hansen yeah. was going to be here. Yeah, that's not a great excuse. No, 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 no. Well, no. now, to be fair, that's why I showed up today. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Chris Hansen I just wanted to see if I was going to be here. Yeah, I've you got don't some have chat cookies. logs I've got to go yeah. over with you, by the way. <laughs> so you, you touched on it, and you've been asking a million times, but let's go back to that sure. seed. Who brings that up? Is that a, your idea, or is that somebody on the staff that goes, I've got this idea? So... A friend of mine who's a reporter in Detroit said in a conversation one day, have you heard of this group, Perverted Justice? And I had not. And at the time, Perverted Justice was an online watchdog group of volunteers who would pose as children online. If an adult made a date after a sexually charged conversation, they would post that adult's ID on their website. And occasionally law enforcement would make a case because the chat log is where the chat is where the crime usually takes place. 
And so I started to think if we could use their ability to be decoys posing as children in, in chat rooms with our ability at Dateline at the time to wire a house with hidden cameras and microphones, I thought it could be very compelling. And we knew this was an issue back in 2004. We had anecdotal stories of kids meeting adults online and being killed or injured or assaulted sexually. But it's hard to piece together something in a big way on television with an interview with a grieving parent and B-roll shots of click clacking on the keys. You have to infiltrate this. You have to be enterprising in your reporting. And I remember driving out to the Sting House in Long Island, New York, and wondering, God, what if nobody shows up? What if I've just wasted tens of thousands of dollars of the network's money? And with that, my producer calls and says, where the hell are you? Two guys are scheduled to show up in 45 minutes. And Jeez. in two and a half days in that first investigation, 17 men surfaced in the investigation, including a New York City firefighter. Oh, wow. wow. So what does that tell you? Now, in the first couple investigations, we just did it. Right. With perverted justice. You didn't have law enforcement. We didn't have law enforcement. We had security. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie Knight, who's been my security guy for many years, uh, who's former NYPD. And we rented the house from a retired NYPD guy, but we didn't have any police there. So the case of the firefighter was prosecuted by the FBI, but the other guys were in the wind. We did it again in, in Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. A couple dozen guys show up including a rabbi, a teacher, a military uh, intelligence uh, officer, and a guy who walked in naked. Yeah. Now, in that case, in those cases, Fairfax, Virginia police did go after, the FBI did go after, and more of the cases were prosecuted. But it became clear at that stage, we had to collaborate, partner, uh, embed with law enforcement. We had to have law enforcement involved because... From a social justice standpoint, you know these guys had to face the music, yeah. so, face uh, the criminal justice system. So that episode you're talking about, the guy that came in naked, was John Canelli. John Canelli, special guy 29. He was neither 29 nor that special. <laughs> Didn't you out. catch him twice? <laughs> you call him twice. We did. We did. So he walks in, and the decoy was, you know, being kind of. Uh, a little risque, I suppose, uh, for somebody who's a child and said, it'd be really cool if you walked in naked. And so he strips in the garage. And we have a camera in the garage, like in a stuffed animal or something. So we're watching this in the next room. And this was only our second investigation, but we had learned a lot from the first. So we had more cameras, more monitors. It was, you know, better structured. And he walks in and I'm looking at Ronnie and I said, this guy's naked. <laughs> <laughs> so I, they had a, t in case he did it, we had a towel uh, on the refrigerator and I walked by, grabbed it and gave it to him. And he said, I'm sorry, sir. I wasn't going to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> but we had him, the decoy said, close your eyes and count to 10 or whatever. And you'll get your surprise. So he's counting down. One, two, three. <laughs> I said, can you believe this? I walk out, we do the confrontation, do the interview. He leaves, you know, with his clothes in his hand hands and he gets in his red pickup truck drives away the next day yep. i hear a commotion in the room in this beautiful house in suburban virginia herndon virginia and i walk up there and i said what's going on he said remember the guy who walked in naked last night i said hard to forget <laughs> he said well he's back online same guy in a different chat room trying to hook up with another 13 year old boy oh, that's <laughs> and i said i said look now i don't want to leave the sting house because other guys could show up but I also don't want to miss the opportunity to show who we're dealing with here. Right. I said, set up a meeting, find a McDonald's. I took both mobile crews. We went out there. And sure as heck, he shows up in his red pickup truck, goes into McDonald's, you know, walking fast. And we move in. And we're waiting for him to come out. And I'm thinking, what am I going to ask this guy? <laughs> and he may run out into traffic. He may freak out he, you know who knows what he's going to do i better have a really good well formulated question because that may be the only thing in terms of audio we record here as he scrambles away and so i said to him the only thing i could think of which was at the time i've been in this business 24 years and i've very rarely been at a loss for words but i don't know what to ask you first son <laughs> he said oh no i was you know i'm sorry i'm getting treatment i said john i got news the treatment's not working <laughs> it's not working you know and and again look 
I know there are darkly humorous moments to all of this. Yeah. Right. And that's part of what has made this entire franchise so compelling. But it is serious. Mm -hmm. And children get hurt and injured and killed and sexually assaulted uh, on a weekly basis here. Yeah. And think about this for a minute. The, the, when we started this, we merely had decoys in chat rooms on AOL and Yahoo, right? This is 20 years ago. Yeah. Maybe MySpace, if you even remember what MySpace is. <laughs> well, today, and, and so the guys were concentrated in, in two or three different groups. So you would, you know, we've had 51 guys show up in some of these investigations early on. Today, there are so many more platforms upon which an adult can approach a child. There's more of this activity than ever before, I would argue. Right. Well, but it's more difficult to detect and catch somebody because you can't be in all these different places. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it a lot difficult. You know, like you said, those <laughs> A I remember AOL. Mm -hmm. Everybody remember AOL? I, I, I remember AOL. being on yeah. AOL and I, I like when y'all were doing those first <laughs> investigations, you know, I remember like when you listen to them talk about how constant I mean, you had people that were driving two, three, four, five, six four, hours, five hours to get there. To get there. You had one guy that I think showed up one time in a truck at like four AM in the yeah. morning. Um, but it's just like you said now with with social media and 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 phones and and TikTok and all this, man, it's got to be more difficult. Well, it is, and and so you you've got uh, online gaming, mm -hmm. you've got all kinds of uh, chat applications, uh, places where guys can act out fantasies, Snapchat, which you know has a component where some of the conversations and pictures disappear, right? Hard to track, and then once the initial meeting take, takes place, oftentimes this goes to one-on-one -on -one communication via text on a phone. And so it's hard to track. And, and we continue to come up with different scenarios and, and, and find these different platforms where these guys are. But it, it seems to be never-ending. I mean, if, if me potentially being there isn't a deterrence, if law enforcement at all levels, city, county, state, and federal, uh, keeps on doing these investigations, which they do, you know, it's not just me. There are investigations taking place independent of what I do on, on, a, on a monthly basis in this country. Is there a way to, like, if one of these guys come in there, is there a way to know if he, like, what if he has a gun or something? Well, well that's know. that's an excellent question and one we grapple with in every investigation. And a, another reason why we collaborate with law enforcement. Law enforcement has the ability, and we have some research ability through LexisNexis and, and other means, other strategic alliances we have to do that. But, you know, if this guy has two guns registered to his name, and a concealed weapons permit, you've got to think about this for a minute. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had one in, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, in Marquette County, a guy we knew had two guns. Now, he was in his 60s. He did have a backpack. He didn't seem menacing, at least to everybody on site, the detectives, myself. And so I did make the initial approach. But we had a high state of security there, a high state of awareness. Now, if somebody, and we've had this happen, says, well, I was a sniper in the military and I don't go anywhere without my gun, that's an argument and a reason for the police to take him down first, search him, give him his rights, have an initial interview before I get a chance to talk to him. And we do that in, in some instances because it's not worth getting anybody hurt. We yeah. had a case in Flagler Beach, Florida, where we did a sting operation. And we had finished for the night. And all week, this guy had been chatting. I remember his name, Todd Spikes. And he was, according to the chat, formerly in law enforcement. And we had no indication that he was still in law enforcement. There was some talk about it, but he said he had moved on to something else. But the chat was graphic, what he wanted to do to this girl, and disturbing. And it got to the point, because the chat had been going on for so long, that we thought, okay, this guy's just getting his rocks off chatting. He's not actually going to show up. And that happens. Yeah. Some of these guys just want to have the chat and the fantasy, and that's the end of it. So we're back at the hotel, having a beer and a sandwich, and we hear from the decoy with perverted justice at the time. This guy says he's gone by the house, it's dark, and he's at a payphone not far away. 
And so we can't, you know, it takes a minute to turn these houses on. You know, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of electronics. You know, it's like this studio. Mm-hmm. Right. So the police uh-huh. in Flagler Beach pull him over on a traffic stop. In his pocket is a loaded 38. In his vehicle, a shotgun, an assault rifle, and another handgun, hundreds of rounds of ammunition, chainsaw, bulletproof vests, oh, you gosh. know, handcuffs. Yeah. And, and so what is this guy up to? And it turns out he is a cop in a small town at the Florida-Alabama border. I remember uh, that one. So what happens if Todd makes it into the house, realizes he's been caught, and now I know he's not going to get a shot starts off. Starts trying to shoot the place up. No, well, he's not going to get, because it, it's, it's, we're covered, you know, right. we, all that's been thought through. But you don't need that mm-hmm. t- to happen. It's important to do these investigations. It's mm-hmm. important to remind people that this happens to create awareness and, and the continuing dialogue that, that we accomplish with these, these investigations. But you know, nobody should get hurt doing it. I, I mean, look, I know it's inherently dangerous, but I've made it as, we have made it as safe as it possibly can be uh, for both the crew, myself, and law enforcement. Have you ever been scared of something? I'm always on edge. You know, I don't, I don't carry a lot of fear with me in general. Right. I, you know, I, I go back to what Marie Curie said many, many years ago, which is, you know, you shouldn't live with fear. You just need to understand right. the world around you. I'm paraphrasing, but, right. you know, so I, I just don't get that. You know, I, I, I've achieved this, you know, a state of life where I, I just don't get too worried about it. Now, I, that doesn't mean to say that we don't take precautions. Right. But... You know, if you know, you can never get, let your guard down. You can never take it for granted because that's when accidents happen. Right. I mean, you got to be on point. And yeah, I still get, you know, my, my heart and my throat when I go out there. And, and that's what keeps you sharp. Well, when you first started doing this, like. Was- oh, I, you know, I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. Now I'm going to, because you're there, yeah. right? And this guy's coming in. And you don't know much about this fellow, except that he wanted to have sex with a 12, 13, or 14-year-old girl. Mm. And you're going to go talk to him now. <laughs> and you've got a counter in between you and him. Yeah. Now, as we always say about sharks and other predators, they're more afraid of you than you are of them. Yeah. And that's all fine in the storytelling part of this. But when you're the man who's standing uh-huh. there and the shark's right there in the ocean mm-hmm. or the tiger's right there or growling at you, it's a little different. Yeah. Yep. Well, the rabbi, I remember the rabbi, yeah. he tried to come across the table on you. You know, that's an interesting interesting story because if you look at the video it looks like he's lunging at me and that ronnie knight steps in to protect me which he was protecting me but what the rabbi was really doing was reacting to a photo that he had sent uh to somebody he thought was a 13 year old boy of him gleefully performing oral sex on another man and so we had a copy of that photo and at some point during the interview i had slipped it over to get his attention and he freaked out that we had it <laughs> and he was grabbing at the photo uh, thinking mm. that you know that's our only copy <laughs> like we don't have the ability to get whatever we want right, right. you know and so he was going for that photo he wasn't really trying to physically hurt you've me. never had to tell one of them to step back for like at their ass whooped i've never said use those words <laughs> exactly i have said you don't want to do this yeah and law enforcement has stepped in and taken control of the situation. Y'all had one that the guy showed up where he had like guns and duct tape and all kind of like a rape kit in the back of his Yeah, car. that was in Fairfield, Connecticut. Yeah. So a guy shows up. He was on the list to become a police officer in the state of Connecticut. He had gone through the state academy. He was working for the local cable company, which means he was in people's homes, theoretically, doing work. And he shows up to meet a teenage girl after a sexually charged conversation, and in his vehicle is a handgun loaded, uh, a camera capable of making a video, and some rope and duct tape. So what, what's, what's that about? Right. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? What are we doing? <laughs> I like when they say, well, I wasn't really going to do anything, and then, and then you'll go, well, why did you bring condoms? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and so now they think, you know, if they've seen anything about what we do, Now they think if they don't bring condoms, see, I wasn't going to have sex. I said, no, that means you were going to have unprotected sex (laughs) with a 13-year-old girl, even worse. Yeah. So don't don't try to game me on this. I've I've done this a lot. What what percentage of them eat the baked goods you offer them? 
As I'm going down, yeah. I'm eating a brownie. Yeah. If, if Chris we Hansen's talking about a brownie. <laughs> you know, we do the podcast, Predators I've Caught. Yeah. Right <laughs> and I go back into the previous cases deep, and I immerse myself in the transcripts of the chat, and I go back and look at the videos, and, and I talk about these cases. And there are things that I don't even remember or I didn't know at the time, and we figure out where the guy is today. And the last guy that we did, the episode that drops next, was he was eating the, the cookie the whole time. It was in Fort Myers, Florida. And I'm thinking, I think it's more nervousness yes. than anything else. It's not like they're exactly hungry. Now, they'll, when they think they're going to have this date, and this last guy rolls up on his Harley, and he walks in, and he's, he finishes his cigarette, and you know, fin- he walks in, he's chomping the cookie, talking to the girl, and he's thinking, he's got a maid, man. This hot girl, his fantasy is going to come true, and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I come out, and... <laughs> chokes, on, chokes on the cookie. We had one. We had one, we had one where uh, they had left the brownies out unwrapped overnight, yeah. and they got you know how brownies get. They yeah, get hard. A and we, had a, <laughs> we had a microphone right in the you know pot of plant in the middle of the table, and the guy goes out and <laughs> and you can hear. You, you, you must have broken. It sounded like you broke a tooth. In the damn thing, you know, he was chewing on the he microphone. Was on the microphone. <laughs> no, the sound guy's got blew his ears out. You know. Well, uh, Jeff, the pizza guy, Jeff Sokol. Yep, Sokol. He just decided he was just going to eat the pizza while you mm-hmm. sat there and yeah, gave it to he him. He was so Jeff shows up after this. He drives all the way from Boston. Yeah. To Fairfield, Connecticut. Yep. And. He comes in and he's smug and cocky and uh, he's wearing this red flannel shirt. I don't know why I remember that, but he goes in for a hug with the girl. And the onside decoy in this particular investigation was so good. And she'd never done anything like this before. She was a student at a local college and uh, was studying theater, at least part of her major was theater. And she was so good, so compelling. And, and what is so interesting about that stage of the, the investigation is the guy doesn't think he's in trouble yet. And so you're watching a conversation take place that would take place had there been an actual girl. Right. And so you capture what this guy is all about. Mm. And we saw this during a recent investigation. It's out on uh, one of our takedown episodes on True Blue Now, where a guy shows up in Ohio after having driven from Indiana, 70, 71 years old, and he thought that he was meeting a, a guy, a father, who was going to pimp out his uh, 13-year-old daughter. Wow. wow. So he walks in. Now, the detective is playing the role of the dad, and the deputy is playing the role of the daughter. So he comes in with his milkshake for the girl, <laughs> all excited, and he, he's, he's looking her over, and she does a little turnaround, sits down, and he's going on about, it's good that your dad's teaching about sex, because boys your age don't know it, nothing about it. And, you know, he's a guy. It was in his 70s. Yeah. And he's, he's all excited. So we watch this play out, and you see it in the episode. And then, you know, the, they lower the boom, arrest him, and I come out and talk to him, and he admits to me that he had met another 13-year-old girl online and met for sex, and that he's got a foster child at home. Oh, no. Wow. Or adopted child. And this is the, the, the coup de grace in this one. <laughs> I said, what do you do? I'm retired. Well, do you do anything? He goes, yeah, I counsel inmates at the jail on their sexual addictions and problems. Jesus. <laughs> and he's in the sting house <laughs> trying to meet a 13-year-old girl. He wants to have sex with the girl. And then, according to the chat, watch the father have sex with the girl. Wow. And he's got a, a, a daughter at home. His wife's at work. And he's telling me that, well, you know, the relationship has grown cold and, you know, we're not intimate anymore. And that's your excuse for yeah. being here and doing all this? Yeah, you're 70, a young girl's 50. Go, let's start yeah. there. How about yeah. that? Yeah, let's start yeah. there. How about that? <laughs> wow. Do you have like a, uh, a certain favorite moment? Like one of those, like I know you come up, you had to come up this with some kind of goal in the end. Right. Do you have like a certain time where something happened, you're like, okay, it was like the most satisfying moment in doing this? <sighs> Well, there, it's about a hundred way tie for first, mm. you know, there are so many, you know, you, you see things. I mean, we had one recently in Michigan, a 61 year old doctor walked in. Now he's at his practice all day. 
he sees 18 patients. It's a family practice. So you have to believe there are women and, and young mm-hmm. women and adolescents in that practice. And during the time of seeing all 18 patients, he finds a time to chat with a teenage girl in a sexually charged conversation and send a picture of his penis while he's treating the patients. Then he gets in his Range Rover, all dressed up Mm -hmm. as you would expect a doctor to be, and comes over here with Coca-Cola for the girl, red wine, in case you want to drink, and Oreos because he's got this fantasy that because she has braces, he wants her to give him oral sex with the Oreo stuck in it. It's oh, a hole. <laughs> so this is a medical doctor. What in the world? Right? Yeah. And he had not seen the show. He didn't know anything. So I start ripping into him, and he starts talking about what he did, and then the police come out to arrest him, and then he feigns a heart attack. So, you know, it's like, Remember Sanford and Son? Oh, yeah. Right. So he's, you know, I'm coming to join you. you know, he's, he's faking this whole thing. And they, they said, well, you know, they think, what, they're going to let you go? No, they've got a medic right there. They take his blood pressure and he's fine and he calms down and, you know, off he goes. But I mean, he, you know, to, to take somebody like that off the street, mm-hmm. no matter what the punishment is, right? And, and the punishment can range from probation and registering as a sex offender in a plea deal, depending on the past, to, you know, 20 years in prison if you've got a previous offense. But the fact that they have to register, the fact that they have to come to grips with this problem is a win Mm -hmm. in my mind. Yeah, I can can imagine that's got to be the most satisfying feeling is to be able to stop that kind of thing. I mean, I don't... I don't take any great pleasure in watching somebody grovel or get on their knees or please, 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 or how much do I give you to get out of this thing? I, none, of that, none of that is exciting to me. What, is, what, what, what I think is important about this is that obviously this problem isn't going away. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. We've been doing this, as I mentioned earlier, for nearly 20 years. Guys bring up the specter of law enforcement or my presence in the chat. So what does that tell you? It tells you that this is so prevalent and so powerful that you might as well liken it to a heroin addiction. If you tell the heroin addict that there's a 20% chance there'll be fentanyl in your heroin, most times they're going to take that risk. If you tell Mm -hmm. the guy there's 20% chance it's going to be law enforcement or Chris Hansen, he's going to take the risk. Now, that's not to excuse the behavior because it's an addiction. But there is a component of this that the fantasy becomes so overpowering, so important that they're going to throw caution to the wind and they're going to try and fulfill this. And that's, you know, because of our internet era. I mean, the the addictive nature, the 24-7 access, and the anonymity. There's a whole class of these predators who wouldn't be doing this without the internet. Right. I mean, there's the hardcore guys who'd be at the playground or the food court at the mall who, the bad little league coach or scout master, we've all seen those stories. They're not going to change. You got to lock them up forever. They're the younger guys who are opportunists, who think, well, she, you know, she may be 13, 14 now, but you know, if it works out in a couple of years, it's a Romeo and Juliet situation. It's wrong, it's illegal, it's damaging. There's a reason why we separate kids by grade in high school. There's a big difference between a 15-year-old and an 18-year-old. It's not the same as a 30-year-old and a 33-year-old, right? right? It's a different ball game. And then there's, there's these guys in the middle, the doctors, the lawyers. We found cops, people from all walks of life, and they get obsessed with fulfilling this fantasy for whatever fuels them, yeah. whatever reason. And they, they, they blur the lines between fantasy and reality online, and the next thing you know, they're knocking on our door. So when you confront these, when you confr- confront them, do you think, like, when they go to Babylon, are they try- or do you think that they're excited to talk about it, or do you think they're just trying to talk their way out of it? I think each guy is different. Yeah. I think there, there are guys who try to talk their way out of it, who's just going to, you know, lie to my face. Yeah. I would never do that. I've got children of my own, to which I always say, well, how would you feel <laughs> if your 14-year-old daughter was home alone and some 52-year-old came in after ha- saying this, this, and this with, a, you know, a condoms and- uh, Mike's Hard you know, Lemonade. Mike's Hard Lemonade or a soda pop yeah. to violate your daughter. How would you feel? I'd be mad as hell. I'd whip his ass. Okay, so what should happen to you? Well- you should let me go. Yeah. Mm. I was just here to warn her. And because I feel that way about my daughter, I'm, I feel that way about this girl. I said, why don't you call 911? Why don't you call social services? Well, I didn't think there was time for that. Well, there's, you're going to have plenty of time to think about now, son. 
<laughs> well, you, you mentioned people groveling and uh, you threw out people offering money. Have they really offered you financial stuff? In one of the re- in one of the investigations over the summer up in Marquette, Michigan, and this is all on camera, you know, yeah. and we use it in the piece. He said, how much have I got to pay to get out of this? <laughs> I said, hey, there isn't a number, <laughs> sir. It's a grown man. It, like I think it was like sixty years old. Tell him he can talk to the magistrate. Yeah, when they tell him they're going to tell you exactly how much you <laughs> yeah. need to pay to get out of here. Yeah. No, you, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of sixties and seventy year olds. Are most of the men older? Would you say it goes all across the age groups? I mean, I, we, we've had guys show up eighteen years old to I think seventy four was the oldest. No women. We've never had a woman show up in our sting. And the therapists, the people who study this tell us it's because in the female predator scenario, you're more likely to see the teacher student. We just did a story for True Blue on, I, we have a news magazine where I do a lot of interviews and, you know, topical stories called uh, True Crime Nation. And we interviewed the prosecutor and the defense lawyer in a town in Tennessee, not too far from Memphis, where a female teacher uh, was allegedly having a sexual relationship with a student. And she's married to a sheriff's deputy. Oh, wow. Right? And it turns out the defense lawyer is a former sheriff's deputy had a kid in her class. N- no improper activity alleged in that case. But this kid would come over, and now apparently, <clears throat> according to investigators, she might be pregnant with the student's baby. Mm. So this whole mess happens. But <clears throat> the female predator doesn't like the anonymity. Right. So you're going to see that scenario, whatever fuels it. I can't explain it. It's mind boggling to me, but it happens. The Mary Kay Letourneau scenario. Yeah. In the male predator situation, <clears throat> they like the anonymity. It's exciting to them. I mean, they like to know who they're meeting, but the fact that they just met up today, you know, gets them off a little bit. Right. I noticed in, in you know, some of the, uh, I guess, what made you decide in the earlier investigations after you did them to get law enforcement involved? We had no choice. From a social responsibility standpoint, we couldn't let these guys just wander off. Yeah. Then you're no better than some of the vigilante amateurs that you see on social media creating a dangerous situation. And secondly... Just purely from a television production standpoint, it was unfulfilling to our audience yeah. to not have some sort of finality, to not have, you know, the boom lord on these Accountability. guys. Accountability. Yeah. It, it, it's because you can't just have them, you know, whistling Dixie going down the street afterwards. I mean, something's got to happen. And uh, so there was no question in my mind when we had the opportunity to work with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department in California, we needed to do this. And we've done it with law enforcement ever since. So they were sending y'all letters at the network? I don't remember who reached out to whom. I think they knew they had a problem in in their community. Every community has this issue, by the way. There's no issue. There's no community in America that that does not have this activity. Right. And you talk to a sheriff like Grady Judd and Polk or Chris Swanson and Genesee, and they'll tell you, if you're not doing this, then I'm just pushing the guys out to your county where it's going to take place. And I think that's the uh, that's an honest assessment. Mm-hmm. Let's go back uh, when it first started. You mentioned, hey, maybe we'll do three or four of these. Yeah, it'll be fun. We're done. But now, fast forward, still doing it twenty years later. I mean, you are part of pop culture. You are, like we've mentioned, people go, but we're going to show up here, and Chris Hansen's going to be here. Yeah. Like, I mean, that sometimes is, I am. That is pop <laughs> culture. <laughs> when did I'm sure you see ratings, and of course, you know, back in Dateline, I'm sure everybody's. At, meticulously looking at ratings and stuff. But when did you and everybody go, man, this is skyrocketing and really going further than we ever imagined? My sons uh, went to a uh, high school in Connecticut, and it was no big deal to have a dad on television because other kids' dads did a lot of cool stuff. Wall Street guys, shipbuilders, athletes, coaches. So again, it was no big deal. But when South Park did a Chris Hansen episode. <laughs> and they had a Chris Hansen character on South Park. I'm Chris Hansen. Why don't you take a seat? Oh, I don't want to take a seat. Have a seat. No, I'm just going to go. Take a seat right over there. Suddenly, I was the coolest dad of them all, you know. <laughs> That's like the moment you are in. There you are right well, it's there. It's in yeah. pop culture. If you're, if you're on South Park, you're on pop culture. So, yeah, we've That's been on South Park, Family Guy a couple times, Simpsons. Simpsons actually has you 
do the voice. So you go into the studio in New York, you put on that, and then they send you all the Simpsons swag, which I gave to the boys, which was, you know, <laughs> we even had a Simpsons uh, GPS with Homer's <laughs> voice on it, <laughs> which I thought was very cool. Hello, Homer. <laughs> How do you know my name? I'm Chris Hansen from To Catch a Credit Whore. South Park mm. doesn't tell you, they right? They do it. They do. They just do it. And so I'm in San Francisco on a shoot unrelated to the Predator investigations. And one of my agents texts me and says, uh, South Park studio tonight is pretty funny. I said, okay, I'm on uh, West Coast Time Zone. I'll check it out in three hours. And then about 20 minutes later, it's taken a dark turn. <laughs> 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 Who would have ever ever thought that yeah. that was going to happen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 very reward in all sincerity. It's very rewarding to know that we've got three generations of people who follow this stuff for whatever yeah. reason. I mean, we walk in. My wife and I walk into a a friend's child's birthday party. You know, on a Saturday, and the kid's fourteen, fifteen years old. It's like. Keith and Mick walking into my 60th birthday party. You know, it's, 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 you know, it, and it's, it. again, I didn't design it to be that way. It just happened for all the reasons that, you know, we've been talking about here with you fine gentlemen, but you, you need to take that as currency and, and use it for good. So yeah, it gets me into a lot of doors in law enforcement. It allows us to do a lot of great, compelling enterprise stories, whether it's sextortion or we've got another documentary coming out on the Facebook fiend. This guy has been conning women around the country. We've got a lot of documentaries, a lot of series. And this sextortion issue, I don't know if you guys are hip to this yet, but it, it, it's, it's rampant where con men from... Western Africa or Eastern Europe are posing as young, attractive girls, luring adolescent guys into conversations, then convincing them to send sexually explicit photos. And they turn right around and ex try to uh, extort money from them. Well, and these kids don't have money. They get $100, $200, and they get whatever they can. And then they shame them. And these young men are committing suicide across the country at an alarming rate. We profile a case in South Carolina, one in Ohio, one in San Jose, California, and one in Northern Michigan, in Marquette. And most of the time, these cases go unprosecuted because the criminal is half a world away in, in Nigeria, for instance. And in the Marquette, Michigan case, the young man who sadly committed suicide, the criminals in Nigeria were arrested Based upon the fine work of the Marquette County Sheriff and the FBI, they went over there, grabbed them, and they were extradited to Michigan, where they're now facing federal charges for the wow. first time I'm aware of anywhere in the United States. Hmm. And the hmm. true tragedy of these sextortion cases is the kids who are committing suicide are wonderful kids. They just can't see their way out of this adolescent emergency. You know, if they can just talk about it or, 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 Calm down for 15 minutes. Who cares if there's a picture of your junk out there? Grandma's not going to see it. Right. You're still going to go to college. Right. We're going to yell at you for 10 seconds. We'll tease you about it maybe down the road, but it's not worth committing suicide. Right. And as a parent myself, to sit there with a, with a husband and wife, a, a mom and dad, and talk to them about the loss of their child in this way, it is absolutely heartbreaking. We have the power to not only do a series like this for True Blue, but to get it on another platform network, and then do a shorter version that we can give to high schools across the country that will have kids watch, because I'll put an exclusive Predator segment at the end of it. You've got to watch all this stuff first so you know not to fall into this trap. And then you watch this. That's the, that's the energy that we have. You know, and, and that, that's that's the, the currency that has come from the Predator investigations. And that story's on True Blue? We're putting it together right now. I'm it's putting not, it in. Not on it. it will be out there. That's the Marquette one? Well, the Marquette is a... So while we're up there doing this extortion story, I get talking with the sheriff. I said, you know, we should do a sting up here. Have you ever thought of it? He said, yeah, we did one a year ago. We're about ready to do another one. I said, good. I want to be, you know, I want to embed with you. And so that's what we did there. I'm from Marquette, Michigan. Oh. We talked about it. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. It's wow. beautiful. And you don't expect predatory <laughs> activity, much less a sextortion plot in beautiful Marquette, Michigan. It's, right. it's the Upper Peninsula. It's surrounded by Lake Superior and, you know, pristine, you know, 
country and fishing and it's a biking mecca and kayaking, I mean, hunting. It's, it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. And yet, you know, there's crime there. And yeah. thankfully a sheriff who's very proactive. Yeah. It's, uh, growing up there, like I, I would have never thought this. Well, th- I mean, think about this. <clears throat> this, this young man is living in a community where nobody locks the doors. Yet a criminal from half a world away was able to break into the house and, and yeah. get him to kill himself. That can happen anywhere. That can happen anywhere. And it can happen to anybody's kids. And so again, as with the traditional predator investigations, it comes down to awareness and the discussion you have with your, your, your child. This problem isn't going away, right? And all the stories we do, it's not going to stop these guys. So what's the best defense? It's education. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation you have with your children from the very moment they have access to the internet. And it starts with, okay, you can go on there, but there are grownups on there who like to trick children. Children don't like to be tricked. Yeah. And so if you start at that level and expand it, uh, you know, when I was growing up, the advice was don't talk to strangers. Good advice then, good advice today. The problem is the guy who's a stranger on Wednesday is so adept at grooming that he's not a stranger by Friday. And he's offering, we've had cases where a 12-year-old girl was approached on Instagram, where you think you're pretty safe, by a man in Florida, girls in Michigan, guys in Florida, convinces her to sneak out of her parents' house, meet him in a church parking lot. He gets her into a hotel, sexually assaults her, she shows up at an emergency room. They piece together the case. They grab him in Florida. It turns out he admits to two other cases in two other states, all grooming the victims the same way on traditional, easily accessible social media platforms. That's fascinating because I was going to ask, you said it was so spread out. I was going to ask if there was a PSA maybe for parents to tell the kids where to watch out the most, but... It's if everywhere. they're doing it on Instagram, it's everywhere. That's my point. And this, this Facebook fiend guy who's been exploiting adult women, you know, for money and then assaulting them, and, and he was getting away with it. And finally, he's being prosecuted on the East Coast and the West Coast for this. And we profile exactly how he was able to get away with this. But, you know, predators go after the vulnerable. And they exploit and sadly, there are a lot of vulnerable people, whether it's your grandparents on a financial scam or one of these other cons, you know, a single woman in Baltimore who's raising a child on her own who would like some human company from another adult. People meet online now. It's not like, you know, the olden days when I was growing up, you had to, you know, find people. You had to go to a place where people were. Right. We didn't have pagers or cell phones. You had to leave notes or messages if somebody was tech enough to have an answering machine. Right. Or you, you, had had to, you had to find folks. Or you had to have the, you had to have the courage to actually walk up to a to woman. To walk up and, and start a conversation. <laughs> right. And be a decent human being. Right. Didn't have to uh, swipe, Write down a phone number. Swipe right on yeah. Tinder. It's, it's a, you know, look, it's, that cat's out of the bag now. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, see, the way we grew up, it makes it that much more difficult because the parents nowadays, they don't know, yeah. how do you educate somebody on something you're not educated on? Or they're so ensconced in their own online activities, they're not paying attention to what the kids are doing and because they're so busy doing it and setting the wrong example because they're living their lives online. Mm-hmm. That's something to think about too. Kids watch. Yeah. yeah. They see exactly what you're doing. So what do you think about all the, over the years, like you said, it's been 20, 30 years you've been doing this, all the uh, fake Chris Hansons that have come to pass on the internet doing their own predator investigations and trying to do what you do. I catch heat every time I talk about this. <laughs> but I'll, I'll just be you know, straight up with you all. I, I, look, I think there's a place, an important place in society for citizen journalists, people who have platforms on YouTube or other social media sites, uh, podcasts, and crimes get solved because of crowdsourcing information and potential evidence on social media platforms, whether it's a podcast or anything else. And there are great examples of wonderful work done by non-journalists or at least non-traditional journalists. 
But when it comes to the sexual predator area, there is some good work being done, and I think for the right reasons. But more often than not, some of these guys are trying to get clicks and make money online and embarrass somebody without these guys ever paying the price in the criminal justice system. People are getting hurt. There was a guy who was doing this in, in uh, Pontiac, Michigan, who was killed. Now there's some gray area as to whether he just walked into a bad situation and got killed, but he had in the past outed some people. Yeah. And now he's dead. And again, it's kind of gray as to how that particular thing went down. But they have arrested people, law enforcement, trying to out people on the stings. And if you catch somebody and you're going to exploit that moment on your YouTube channel, but that person isn't going to face justice in the criminal justice system, what have you accomplished? Views. Exactly. You can look in the camera right there right now and tell them to quit biting your shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and again, uh, you know, I, I, I went on one of the news magazines to talk about this and everybody was sniping at me. All this other guy's fans were coming at me. Oh, you're, you're not jealous of what? <laughs> you started it. I have my own network. <laughs> right. <laughs> I work with law enforcement. I said, well, you, jealous. You know, I, you know, just, you know, they mostly, some of these guys, and again, high profile people have been exposed doing this on some of these things. Is anybody yeah. famous or semi famous like ever showed up to one of these? Not in mine. Um, prominent, yes. Mm -hmm. right. Famous in their own field, yes. In their profession, yes. We had a guy who showed up and we've had, you know, physicians, as I mentioned. We had one guy who was well-known in the field of oncology, you know, who had chatted with two different decoys posing as 13-year-old girls and then showed up and had money to fight it and did fight it right. for years and still, you know, the charges were upheld. Right. Yeah, I remember that one. Or was that is that the guy that threw and broke his sunglasses? Yeah, Maurice Swollen. Yeah, I remember that episode. First, can we applaud uh, Jeff's memory of? Yeah, I'm impressed. Hey, he's yeah. Yeah. I, thought I thought I, I watched the, all. I thought of I was the Encyclopedia of Predators, <laughs> yeah. but Jeff's got just right up there. With Did that. you do a a binge watch, or no, you just remember I've, these? I've been a fan of this show for years. Man. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Again, I thought I'd watched all of them, and then Jeff's the walking Wikipedia over there. Hey, we, I mean, I, we can fanboy Pred for a minute. Predopedia. It's awesome. No, well, no it's I, awesome. I actually, uh, I actually listen to his podcast when I'm in the gym. The Predators I've caught. Sure. I listen to it Monday. It comes out on Mondays. I listen to it every Monday. L let me touch on another one um, off to catch a predator. It's sure. another story I'm fascinated with that you've been heavily involved with, and I don't know if you guys have seen it, but uh, White Boy Rick is a oh, yeah. fascinating story. What? But why is it so intriguing? Because there's so much on it, and, and still everybody clamor for more info on that. It's, I was one of the first reporters to, to break that story back in about 1986. I saw the, I believe it was the Netflix one, right. and they showed your old footage, and I went, wait a minute. Yeah. That's Chris Hansen yeah. guy. That's Predator <laughs> guys here. That's Channel 7 Action News. And then you've done more on yeah. it uh, since then. But Yeah. Yeah, talk, talk about how, I mean, that just ruled... The airwaves back when it was breaking. Well, it was a huge story in Detroit because here you had a teenage white kid who was pretty prominent, depending on who you talk to, in the cocaine world in Detroit, where that that was you know mostly you know a black world, and so not it wasn't just that because there are other white guys who were heavily involved in cocaine in in, in Detroit at the time. But he was an informant for the FBI. So he would hang out with these drug dealers and provide information to the FBI. And he was put into that position by his father, who was also on the periphery of criminal activity in Detroit, and also giving information to the FBI. So the agents get involved with this kid, and he's feeding him good information. Well, one day, Rick decides that he's going to do his own cocaine dealing. And gets jammed up. Now he is, he rats out the Curry brothers who were big into the drug world. They go away and he's sleeping with one of the Curry's wives, Kathy Volson Curry, who is the niece of the mayor of Detroit at the time, right. Coleman Young. So I get tipped off on a Friday 
that there's been an FBI raid at the townhouse of Kathy Volson Curry. We haul our asses down there in the big Channel 7 Action News truck. And who's in bed with the niece of the mayor but white boy Rick, Rick oh, no. Richard Worshey Jr. <laughs> so I'm standing out there with the camera crew and the whole thing. We captured the whole thing exclusively. And um, I called the mayor's press secretary that day for a comment. And he said, well, you don't really, I don't think that's a story, do you? Said, Hell yes, it's a story. It's going to be, you know, five. Oh, oh, two, five at the top of the show with Bill Bonds leading into it. I'll be live in front of that townhouse. So if you got something to say, now's the time to say it. And, but it was, it was the twists and turns of that case. And, it, you know, the town was, was uh, just obsessed with it in Detroit. And then uh, after that, we got wind of this other drug group, the Chambers Brothers. And the Chambers brothers had made home videos of themselves and their ill-gotten gains. And there's a famous video. And I happened to be on the drug raid. We embedded with the narcotics force at Detroit, in the Detroit Police Department at the time when they found these tapes. So I got copies of them. And I held on to them for months and months and months until the investigation had gotten out of the undercover phase. And we did a five part series on Channel 7, called it All in the Family, and we had these home videos. And in one of the scenes, it's iconic. I said, money, 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 I'm rich, and I'm going to buy this and that, and on and on and on. And it was instantly, you know, a huge deal in Detroit. And it was a lesson to me as a young reporter that if you can infiltrate a situation, and this wasn't a hidden camera thing, but it ended up having that effect because right. we had exclusive material taken by the criminals themselves. Tours, 24 karat gold faucets, the whole thing. <laughs> and so this, 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 this blew people away. And then it made it to the network. And it, it sort of started my career path. In, in a big way towards, you know, serious enterprise journalism and taking people inside the commission of a felony. And I think one of the reasons why the predator investigations have been so compelling is we take people inside yeah. the commission of a felony, watch the guy commit the crime, then meet out some sense of justice on the site and follow the case all the way through. And, and why the podcast, to Jeff's point, I think is so compelling is that we go back and dig into it because so many times I'm dealing with this on the fly. I've got transcripts over here. I've got notes over here. I'm trying to do the best I can. And we do what we do. But with hindsight, you know, I have all the transcripts. You know, I can live in them. I have the video. We can live in those moments and then find out what this guy is up to. And in some of these cases, we're working on interviews with them. And we're going to have some of those on True Blue. But the other interesting backstory of the White Boy Rick thing was the, the guy who directed... The documentary on Netflix is Sean Reck. He interviewed me for that documentary. He is now my partner at True Blue. Really? That's how True Blue came about. Sean had put together the most successful streaming network you've never heard of. AGTV, American Gospel TV, one of his other producers wanted to do something on the gospel world and charlatans in it. And so they did that. And then they turned it into a streamer. And it was hugely successful. So when Sean came to me about True Blue, he already had the template for a streaming network. And when he laid this out for me, I said, yeah, let's go. This is, this is the future of what we do. Yeah, we were talking about that in the hallway uh, earlier before we came in the studio about, you know, taking, kind of taking the bull by the horns and right. using every platform that's available for you to put your Well, it is. Out. And now, you know, now we've got the fast channels coming up. So now we have a True Blue channel on Roku, and soon we will on Pluto and, and, and other platforms. But what True Blue has allowed us to do is to produce content without the bureaucracy of traditional networks. So the last two documentaries I did for Discovery Plus, Love Discovery, have had a long-running relationship with them. But the reality is that to do the Peter Nygaard unseemly investigation for which, you know, I did the interviews and was one of the executive producers, it was 24 months of my life for four hours of television. Well, It should not take two years to do four hours of television. Now, if it's a process piece and it, you know, you're covering something that's happening, yeah, absolutely. 
people do these things for 10, 20, 30 years, these documentaries. But for something that's documented, you shouldn't have to go through all the meetings, the A meeting, the B meeting, the green light meeting, the this or that. I mean, that project literally, uh, the pilot was funded by one network and it was around COVID and they didn't have the budget to do the proper promotion. They g let their option go and we took it to Discovery and they bought it 10 seconds before Peter Nygaard got indicted and the New York Times and other people were on it. And they looked like geniuses because they had this thing that was done mm. and we could instantly put it on Discovery Plus. And I think people can watch that now. It's on one of the, I think it's on Max now. But if, if, you, if you're not hip to the Peter Nygaard story, this guy, you know, you, you think that uh, uh, some of these other predators, uh, Epstein, were bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, th which they are. This guy was truly evil. Yeah. What's it called? It's called uh, Unseemly, the Peter Nygaard Investigation. This is a billionaire fashion mogul. Had his own island in the Bahamas. And he was, it, we had all the behind the scenes videos of what was going on, but he was sexually assaulting women for years, decades, thousands of victims. And some of this took place at his compound in the Bahamas where he'd invite underage girls over, drug them. He had a whole compound and a setup so they couldn't escape. And it got to the point where he truly believed that he could have the fountain of youth through stem cell injections. So the allegation was that he would impregnate these young women, force them to have abortions, and then harvest the stem cells from the fetuses to inject in himself. That Whoa. was his goal. Really, yeah, it's, it's crazy stuff. Whoa. <laughs> so we're in, the middle yeah. of this, we're in the middle of this whole investigation. And it's, you know, it's going to happen. And I get a call from a guy who always shows up with incredible information for me. We just have this relationship. And he says, are you still working on that Nygaard story? I said, yes. He goes, I want you to call this lawyer. He represents Nygaard's personal videographer for like two years. And I make the call. He gives us all the video, the flights, the pamper parties, going to Asia to meet with people about Sam. We have all this stuff. So now... You know, we, we create this very compelling documentary. But again, part of this goes back to having access mm -hmm. because of the attention <laughs> that the predator investigations have done, right. have, have achieved. It's hmm. crazy. Fascinating stuff, man. Excited to still see this go. I mean, you hate to see it because like you said, it's you a, do. I, the I, problem's look, bigger I, than ever. I but. joke with Sean Reck. I said, you know... You know, maybe one day when all this settles down, we can go do a cooking show in <laughs> Italy or be like Stanley Tucci or, you know, Jose Andres to go to Spain or something. But sadly, I don't think that's in my, my near term future. <laughs> so when we're going to get a Jeff Sokol uh, Predators I've Caught podcast. I've done an episode on him, but it's probably, you know, here's an interesting story about Jeff Sokol. I reached out to him and his attorney. We tried to get him to do an interview and I worked on it. And one of my producers, Steve Cohen, worked on it. And he just got back and said, I see no interest and in, in no, nothing that'll benefit me from doing this. But he actually went to court to change his name. Yep. And the judge not only denied the request, he denied the request to keep the hearing secret. Oh, wow. Because he felt it was important that people know he's trying to where he is and what he's done. That's one of my favorite part of the part of that podcast is when at the end you go through the whole series again and then you're like, all right, I'm gonna call this guy right quick. Oh yeah. And then you call them and sometimes they answer the phone. Yeah. <laughs> when they hear you on the other end, sometimes oh, they're not got, very happy to some, hear you. Uh, expletives deleted. But <laughs> that's the thing about the podcast, you can air all that. You right. Know? It's pretty interesting stuff. So but um Tell them where they can catch the podcast anywhere. So the podcast is everywhere. Uh, True Blue is T R U B L U. Watch TrueBlue.com for details. We have the Fast Channel out now on Roku. That's five twenty nine or five ninety two. I should check that, but I think it's I think it's I think it's five ninety two. And um, if it's not, it's five twenty nine. But that's on Roku, and Pluto's coming next. And uh, but True Blue has all kinds of incredible documentaries. Other shows, we have Iron Sheriff that takes you behind the scenes. Uh, so it's not just my stuff. It's where all my stuff goes. And True Crime Nation, which is our, our interview and news magazine show. Um, well, before we leave, you know, everybody knows you, obviously, from the Catch Predator 
Um, you know, but we were talking in the hallway. You know, you've got ten Emmys for just news in general that came before that. So I think that's a pretty impressive thing. Well, thank how, you very how much. How long were you with Dateline before? Twenty one years. Twenty one years. Yeah. So I was in local news from. I was lucky because when I started. I was still in college. I was a senior in college when I started for the NBC station in Lansing, Michigan. I talked this news director into giving me a job, and I made four four ninety five an hour for all the fires I could chase and city council meetings I could cover. <laughs> and when I graduated, they put me on full time. And then I was Tampa, Detroit for ten years, and went to NBC in nineteen ninety three. And then uh, True Crime or uh, uh, True Crime Daily, Crime Watch Daily rather, and then uh, Discovery, and now. Um, True Blue, which is for a guy like me at my stage of the game, it's a dream come true. I mean, we have all the ability to do any story we want and um, to own the content, to own the distribution of the content, to, to be at a stage of my career where I know what is important, I know what people want out of me, and to be able to produce it on a daily basis is uh, truly incredible. It's pretty awesome. Man, great stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. I could pick your brain about it for, but that's the beauty of the podcast. Yeah, I can check out the podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yep, it's a lot. Well, Chris, man, we appreciate you. Well, guys, I appreciate you, and thanks for having me down here and and uh, being a part of all this. Yeah, it's man, it was a, it, it was good, man. It yep. was a lot of information. So we like to thank everybody for tuning into the episode. Make sure that you subscribe, like, follow, all that good stuff. Uh, leave a comment on below the episode if uh, if you've ever run into Chris Hansen. So, <laughs> so guys not at, not at an airport yeah right right thank you guys y'all tune in to us next week